All right, church, how are we doing, everybody? Are you good? Are you good? Oh, man, it's so good to see everybody here today. I want to take a minute, and I want to welcome everybody who's watching right now online, and, of course, everybody who's over at that South Side, South Campus. We love you, South Campus, and uh, we love everybody who's watching with us, everybody who's here. So come on, will you put your hands together for that person sitting next to you right now, watching online, over that South Side, South Campus. Man, what a, uh, what a great season uh, of ministry we're experiencing here at Summit Park. God is doing so many things. I want to take a minute, and I want to celebrate. Uh, some of you saw that baptism video. Well, all of you saw that baptism video just a second ago. And I want you to know, we had, last Sunday, we baptized 36 people right out in the front here at North Campus. Come on, isn't that amazing? Man, how many of you know God is still working? How many know he's still on the move? How many know he's not done yet? So it's just cool to see it and to be a part of it. And man, I'm so thankful. Thank you for praying. Thank you for being a part of it. For those of you who got baptized, I just want you to know the best is truly yet to come. Like, man, God has great things for you. And, um, and, he, and we love being a part of it. So uh, one of the things we've started recently is our Alpha class, okay? So we started a, a, a class for new believers or people who just want to know more about the Bible, questions about their faith. And so that's on Tuesday nights. And our very own Pastor Roger is teaching it. He's doing a phenomenal job with it. We've got a great group. If you would like to be a part of that, if you got baptized, you want to be a part of that. Or if you didn't get baptized, you want to be a part of that. We'd love to have you. Because our commitment is to help more people find and follow Jesus. If you believe it, say, I do. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm so excited. We're starting a brand new series on the book of Nehemiah today, okay? Never preached the Nehemiah, never, never been through this book, but I'm excited about it because the more I learn about it, the more pumped up I get about the possibility of applying it to our life. And so I can't wait to jump into this content, Nehemiah chapter 1, okay? So if you have your Bibles, if you have paper Bible, flip uh, to your Bibles about midway through the Old Testament. Um, and if you have a digital Bible, it's, it's right there. You can, find, you can actually just type it in, and it will pull it up. So I'd love to have you follow along, because I'm actually going to just preach right out of chapter 1 today. So we're just literally going to go verse by verse on this, and Nehemiah has a lot to say, and I can't wait to get to it. But the theme today, if, like, if I was thinking about a theme of really not only this first chapter, but really the whole book is, is, is an idea that, that I experience every single, probably at least weekly, but it's with my kids. Uh, it's, and many of you know I have three kids, and I, you, you know this because I, I use them quite often for illustrations, about every week. Um, but I have three kids, and one of the things I love hearing from my kids is, Daddy, can you fix it? Right? Isn't it so sweet? Like, you know, they come up, Daddy, can you fix it? And they say this a lot because they break things a lot. Parents know what I'm talking about? You can't have anything nice. I'm waiting until they're all out of the house. And I'll have a, I have a few years in between when they leave the house and we have grandkids where we can actually have a few nice things. It's a short time, and then we'll just go to heaven. <laughs> but I, I, in the meantime, we're not going to have anything nice, but, but they, they, just, they break things. They break things. They break their things. They break my things. They break my wife's things. They just break things. And I, but I love when they say, Daddy, can you fix this? Now, now here's the thing. I can't fix anything. Like, I can't fix anything. I am not mechanically inclined at all. Like, I just can't. I'm just like, no, nah, I'm just going to have to hire somebody to do this. Like, for anything, small motor repair, not a chance. Hanging pictures, uh, it's about a 50-50 chance. I can't do any. So I'm a fourth-generation window cleaner, okay? So that's, I can sweep. I can clean a toilet. Like, I'm really good. Like, I'm fast, but that's all I can do. So when my kids say, can you fix it? I'm like, all I'm thinking is duct tape and, duct tape and super glue. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? It's like, it's like uh, I got YouTube, I got duct tape and super glue, let's go. Like, that's it. So that's, that's the idea, Daddy, can you fix it? And when you look at Nehemiah, that's kind of the idea for this book. That's kind of the idea for this book. Daddy, can you fix it? Because... The context, let me give you the context. There's a little bit of history here, but 
The context is that the nation of Israel has been taken into captivity. All right, so why, the Old Testament, the nation of Israel is God's chosen people, okay? They are to be a light to the world. They are to be an example to the world so that they show people what God is like and what God can do in your life. And so, but throughout their history, God keeps saying, hey, do this, and they keep not doing it. Anybody relate? Okay, so this is, this is Israel, right? They keep doing what they're not supposed to be doing, and they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so, and because of it, there's consequences. And God said, don't do this, and don't serve other gods, don't worship idols, and they would. And so God's like, well, I'm going to have to take you into captivity like I told you. And so what God does is he uses the nation of Babylon to come take the nation of Israel into captivity. It's basically like a big, massive timeout, okay? That's what it is. It's to teach them a lesson. And, and while they're in captivity, God's heart is ultimately to be right in relationship again. How many of you know that's always God's heart? God always wants to be right in relationship with you. And if you don't know that, and if you hear nothing else today, let me just encourage you with that. God wants relationship with you. He loves you, and he wants a relationship with you, even in spite of the things that you've done, okay? That's the nation of Israel. That's the book of Nehemiah, okay? So, all right, God wants to restore things, but it's not, it's not right yet. And, it's, and, and what happens is, is Nehemiah finds out that the city is in ruins, and it leaves the whole nation, and Nehemiah leading it, saying, Dad, can you fix this? And here's the good news. The answer is, yes, he can. God can, God will, God wants to, and he wants to use us to bring it about. That's the book of Nehemiah, okay? And some of you some of you might be thinking, as you're, as you're getting ready to, to look at this book, some of you might be looking at some of the brokenness in your own life. Some of, you might, some of you might be seeing the things in your own life that need fixing. Maybe there's a relationship that isn't right. Maybe there's an addiction that you're struggling with. Maybe there's a mindset that you can't seem to get free from. Can I encourage you with this? The book of Nehemiah will teach us when you're looking at brokenness in your life and in your world, the answer to the problem, God, can you fix this, is yes. And he wants to do something about it. Yeah, that's worthy of a clap. That's worthy of an excitement. Okay, so here's the, here's the context. You have a couple of different characters in the Old Testament. Zerubbabel. Some of you remember Zerubbabel from our forward campaign. Like maybe the funnest name in the Bible. You know, Zerubbabel. Everybody say Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. It's just a fun name. It's a fun name to say. I just want to encourage somebody out there to name your baby Zerubbabel. Why not? Especially if you already have like three or four. I mean, come on. If you're on your fifth kid, come on, name him Zerubbabel. Even if it's a girl. Zerubbabel. Okay, so Zerubbabel's job is he is rebuilding the temple. So he goes back to Israel to rebuild the temple. So he rebuilds the temple. That's where worship is going to take place. Then you have a guy named Ezra. Ezra shows up. Ezra is reinstilling the worship at the temple, okay? So things are starting to happen with the remnant that is there in Jerusalem, but most everybody else is still in Babylon, okay? Which has now been taken over by the Medo-Persians. Totally different government now. And so they're mostly in exile, and now here comes the character Nehemiah. Nehemiah is gonna rebuild the walls of the city, okay? The walls of Jerusalem. And what he's showing us, right out, of, right out of the gate, he's teaching us a lesson. And if you're taking notes, this is the lesson. Hurry up and wait. If you're taking notes, write this down. Hurry up and wait. Maybe some of you have been in the military before. You know this is kind of like a joke. It's an ongoing joke in the military. It's like, like that's what your officers do. Just get you to hurry up to get to a place and just wait. You know, the officers will get you to a place. Just hurry up, hurry up and wait. And they hurry up and wait. It must be one of the most frustrating things in life to go through, right? Where you hurry up and wait. Like you got to get to the DMV only to wait. Uh, you're picking your kids up in the, in the car line. You hurry up 
to wait. Hurry up and wait. Hurrying up to wait can be one of the most frustrating things, but I want to encourage you today. It can actually be one of the best things because I oftentimes think it is the thing that God absolutely wants us to do. When we see brokenness, when we see dysfunction, when we see a need, sometimes the best thing we can do is hurry up and wait on God and wait on God. And that's what Nehemiah chapter one shows us. It's powerful. So here's the, here's the deal. Before we jump into this, if you have any brokenness in your life, if you have any dysfunction, if you have anything that needs fixing, then the book of Nehemiah is for you. And he's going to teach us to hurry up and wait. All right? So if you're ready to jump in, say I am. All right, let's do this. Nehemiah chapter one. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, Maybe that's the funnest name to say in the Old Testament. Hakaliah. <laughs> in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while it was in the citadel of Susa. Pause, put a pin in that. What's happening here? Okay. We're going to find out at the end of this chapter that Nehemiah is a cupbearer. Okay? So what Nehemiah does for the king is what I like to do at Andy's for my kids, right? As each little dessert comes by, I take a taste of it just to make sure it's not poison. I just have to try it. I just got to make sure. You never know. That's what Nehemiah does. But it's for real because in that day, if you wanted to uh, assassinate a king, you would poison their food. And so Nehemiah gets the food, takes a little taste. They wait a few minutes. He's still breathing. The king can eat it. That's, That's his job. So he's always with the king. So he's with the king in the citadel in Susa in November, okay? So this is like their winter retreat. Think about like Florida, all right? They're going there in November because they know it's going to be, you know, 80 plus degrees. Think Florida or maybe even think Kansas City because who knows? It could still be 80 degrees in November. So this is Nehemiah. He's close to the king. He's got a good life. He eats well. He's well taken care of. Verse 2, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. All right, so it's from Jerusalem. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. He's like, hey, how's everybody doing? How's it going? They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. Everybody say, "Uh uh-oh, this is bad news. And here's why. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. They've rebuilt the temple. They've started worship again, but the city walls are torn down. Think about, think about like an ap- apocalyptic type of environment. Think, think, think about some type of dystopian atmosphere. Think about RoboCop. Think about Detroit in RoboCop. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Or Detroit anytime, for that matter. That's what they're seeing. That's what they're seeing. And, and, it's, and it's grieving them. Watch what happens with Nehemiah. He's not just concerned. He doesn't just respond. He weeps. Look at this. Verse 4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. He's moved. He's broken. And it's immediate. In the ESV, if some of you are following along with the ESV version, it says this, as soon as. He's, as soon as I heard that, I was broken and I started crying. He starts, he's broken over this. And then he prays. And we find out that he prays for four months. For four months he prays. And and we don't know if this is just a one-time prayer or if this was a prayer he prayed every day or multiple times a day, but this is what he prays, and his prayer is sheer gold. So I want to read his prayer. Look at this, verse 5. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember 
the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a, as a dwelling for my name. He says, God, you told us if we went away, we would struggle. But you also told us if we would turn back to you, you would redeem us again. God, remember that. They are your servants and your people, verse 10, whom you redeemed by your great strength and mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Verse, verse 2 of chapter 2 says this, and I'm reading the Living Bible because it's going to make a, a lot more sense. It translates it for us. One day in April, four months later. Immediately, he goes to praying, and he prays for four months. He sees a need. He's moved by it. He says something needs to happen. That's brokenness. That can't be. I got to do something. And he hurries up to sit in the presence of God and wait. Now, here's the thing we're going to find out about Nehemiah. He is going to rebuild this wall in a record blistering 52 days. Everybody say, that's fast. It's fast. Part of that's going to be strategy. Part of that's going to be preparation. Part of that's going to be he's surveying the, the, the thing. He's, he's thinking it through. Part of it's just really good leadership. But it's all rooted in waiting on God in prayer. And he's teaching us, before we rush in to fix something that we see broken, the best thing we can do is to hurry up and wait. Okay? So two things this passage teaches us. Number one, care for the things God cares about. And number two, pray for the things God cares about. Pray for the things God cares about. I'm sorry, care for the things and then pray for the things God cares about. And all is rooted in hurrying up to wait. All right, so we're going to jump into this. We're going to unpack it. We're going to walk away better. Before we do, find two people next to you and say, hey, don't just sit there. Hurry up and wait. Don't just sit there. Hurry up and wait. Okay, first thing, care for the things God cares about. Now, Nehemiah hears about the conditions of the walls, and he he starts bawling. He weeps. Like, this is a little bit, like, extreme, right? I mean, it's a little bit like, I mean, it's just a city, right? I mean, it's just, just like, just walls, right? I mean, like, take it easy, Nehemiah. Like, I mean, like, it's not that big of a deal. Like, calm down, right? That's how, when you read it, you're like, what's the big deal? The reason it's a big deal is because Jerusalem is more than a city for the people of Israel. It represents the promise of God. Jerusalem is, is tied to the promise of God. In fact, during this time, there are all kinds of prophecies that are happening. Isaiah is one of the prophets who is prophesying all the time about what God wants to do, not only for the people of Israel, but, but specifically with Jerusalem. As he raises Jerusalem up, he raises the people up, and he lifts up his name, and everybody sees and fears and puts their hope in God. That's the goal. So this is more than just a city. This is God's heart. This is God's heart. And let me just show you a little bit in Isaiah 62. This would, be, this would be just one of the prophecies that's happening. I just want you to get this idea because this is really important to understanding why any of this matters. Okay? So Isaiah 62. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. Zion is Jerusalem. Israel. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet. Till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory. And you will be called a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. In verse 4 he says, no longer will they call you deserted or your name desolate. He goes on to say, you are going to be a delight. That's, that's what God has in store for the nation of Israel, specifically for Jerusalem. And so what is happening is when Nehemiah hears that Jerusalem is in ruins, 
He realizes that the promise of God isn't done yet, and that God's plan isn't fulfilled yet, and I'm a follower of God, so I've got to care about it. Can I tell you today that if you're a follower of God in this place, what should happen in your life is a gradual, ongoing, continual growth of being concerned for the things that God is concerned about. The closer you and I get to God, the closer and the, what we're going to experience his presence and his movement in our life, and the more we are going to care about the things he cares about. We're going to have a heart for his things. He sees a need, and he's burdened by it. Now, here's what's interesting. If you're reading the Bible, you're like, but there are a lot of people who see the need. Some people see the need, and they respond. Some people don't do anything. You know, the reality is, it's possible to look at the same situation and see it in two different ways. Anybody married in the house? Right? Anybody in any relationship? Anybody, like, watch a football game with the other team's fan? How many of you can see the, the same play in two different ways? Right? We went to a Chiefs game, opening, opening game. It was the Browns, as you remember. And the Chiefs won, but, I mean, barely. And, and the whole game was like the Browns, like, just getting first down after first down after first down. Now, we happened to be, like, I don't know, we got cheap seats or something. We were right in front of all, like, the, the Browns fans. Like, literally two rows of Browns fans. And they're cheering for every first down. It was like, ah, oh, man, ah, ah, you guys really loud. Wow, I mean, ah, man, that was a great play. Oh, man. And so when they would see a play, they'd be like, oh, man, look at that's holding. I'm like, no, that's just good blocking. <laughs> I'll be like, oh, man, that's pass interference. No, it's just good defense. How many of you know you can see the same play in two different ways? Why? Why? It's because we see what we're looking for. We see what we're looking for. Much of what we see will depend on what we are looking for. You see what you see because you see what you're looking for. Let me ask you, for, let me ask you about this. Are you looking for God? Are you looking for God? Because if you're looking for God, you'll find him. The Bible says this. You seek him and you will find him when you seek him with all of your heart. Are you looking for God? Are you looking at God's word? Because Nehemiah sees a situation, but he's also seeing the word of God being prophesied. And he's like, I see that situation, but God, I know your heart. And I know your heart is to do something about this. It's brokenness. Can I, I want to tell you, God cares about brokenness. God cares about the broken things in your life. That's God's heart. He cares about the addiction. He cares about the abuse. He cares about the separation. And he wants to do something about it. God's heart is to respond always. Let me just ask you, what is the cause of all of this brokenness? You see brokenness in your life? You see brokenness in the world? What's the cause? You know what the cause is? It's sin. If you really think about it, sin is where everything that's messed up in the world is rooted. It's sin. It's pride. It's making ourselves the center of our universe instead of God. It's greed and selfishness and justice, abuse, anger, lust. Everything in our world is a result of sin. Why were the Israelites in captivity? Because of sin. Why are you and I in, cap in captivity? Why do we have bondage in our life? Why do we have brokenness in our life? Why do we continue to struggle in our life? It's because of sin. And it breaks God's heart because it brings separation. Because God wants to be in relationship with you. God wants to be close to you. Now here's the thing, Christians. You can be in relationship with God and yet not be close to God. You can still be covered by the blood. You can still technically be right in relationship and yet not be close to him. God doesn't want you just to be right. He wants you to be close. And that sin that we, that we have in our heart, it, it brings distance, doesn't it? 
It brings separation. But let me just ask you this. When we see sin in our lives or in the world, how do we respond to it? How do we respond to it? Like, you know, usually sin in our lives, we get, we get defensive, don't we? Right? It's like, you, so, it's like someone's like, hey, you're really, you're really mean. You're really unkind. And what do we say? Well, the reason I'm this way is because of you. And if you wouldn't be so you, I wouldn't have to be so me. Right? We don't say it, but that's right. Someone's like, well, you're very impatient with your spouse. Well, look at her. I'm doing the best I can with this. <laughs> we justify it. We justify it. Or we get, we get accusative. And that is a word. I looked it up. <laughs> did you hear what Sally did? Well, I don't want to gossip, but... Oh my goodness, I can't believe Sally did that. Well, actually I can. <laughs> because that's Sally for you. Sally to a T. We get defensive about our own sin. We get accusative about other people's sin. But we need to look at it like Nehemiah and be broken over it for the life killer that it is. We need to see sin for the life killer that it is. It's not a joke. It's not something to be treated just lightly. It's not to be overlooked. It's like, no, this is, this is bringing death to me. That angry outburst, that lustful moment, that greedy business deal, it's sin. And it breaks God's heart, and it should do something similar in our life. We should break our hearts. He weeps. He weeps. He weeps because God's will isn't being done. I want to just encourage all of us today that we should weep when God's will isn't being done. When's the last time you just wept over God's will not being done? When's the, when's the last time you wept over the lost? Or you, you, you wept over the state uh, of affairs, over, over homelessness, over poverty, over greed. When's the last time you just wept over it? That's what's happening with Nehemiah. And what's interesting is this had nothing to do with Nehemiah, really. His life was great. Think about Nehemiah. He's cupbearer to the king. He's always going to exotic locations. He gets to sleep in a, in a nice room. He's eating really, really good food. And yet he's concerned about something that has nothing to do with him. This is preaching to us, isn't it, church? Like we've got to look at the world around us, and even if we're in our comfortable little bubble and everything's going great for us, we should still be broken for the affairs of things, for the stuff that's happening. It should grip us. And the closer to God we become, the more it should grip us. But it doesn't. Why? I, why doesn't it grip us? And I, I've been thinking about this. I think one of the reasons it doesn't grip, it, grip us like it should is because there's so many people in the world and there's so much happening, so more brokenness. Just, it it kind of makes us numb. And we're constantly connected to the brokenness today like we've never been connected before. Like back in the day, when, when brokenness would happen, when someone would get sick or when, when there would be a funeral or someone would get cancer and you knew the person and you stopped and you cared, right? But now we live in a 24-hour news cycle and social media and we're just scrolling constantly. And it's one thing after another, and it's like light thing after dark thing and light thing after dark thing, and it, and it just desensitizes us to it, doesn't it? 
that you're scrolling, like, oh, family out, family outing, that's cool. What someone had for lunch, oh, that's a really nice pizza. New product ad, oh, that's great. Someone got cancer. Puppy video. Kids starving in Africa. Different puppy video. And it goes on and on and on, and we don't even know what to do about it. It's because we're overexposed to it. What Nehemiah was, Nehemiah was, he was exposed to the word of God, the prophecies of Isaiah and others, and it gripped his heart, and it gripped his heart in such a way that he said, oh man, God's heart is for Jerusalem, so my heart has got to be for Jerusalem, not just puppy videos. So part of this is intake, isn't it? Like, if you want to have a heart for God, you've got to, you've got to watch your intake because it will determine your outcome. But Nehemiah's hearing the, the word of God, and he's got a heart for God because of it. And then what it leads him to do, it leads him to action, but not the type of action that we normally think of. I'm a task-oriented person. Like, in every test that I take, it's like task or people, it's task. I'm sorry, I know I'm a pastor. That's not probably great. I'm working on it. God's working on it. But I'm a task person. I want, a, I want a mountain to climb. Give me something to do. Give, give me something to do. And you know what Nehemiah does? He does the most important thing he could ever do, which is actually stopping and going to God. Before he does anything, he does the most important thing he could do. It's pray. Look at this, and that's pray for the things God cares about. That's the second thought. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. As soon as I heard these words, everybody say, as soon. He did nothing before he did this. He heard that the city was in ruins. He's like, all right, to the prayer closet. Let's go. He didn't go to the king. He didn't go start grabbing bricks. That's my tendency, right? Let's just start doing something. He did the most important thing he could do. He goes to God. Let me ask you, what are you doing with the brokenness in your life? Are you trying to conquer it on your own? Are you trying to tackle it on your own? Are you trying to fix it on your own? Are you, going, are you bringing God into it? Are you going to God? He, check this out. He builds the wall in 52 days. But he spends four months before he does anything in prayer. Now, I'm not a mathematician, okay? But the way I figure it, he spends at least twice the amount of time praying as he does building. Think about that. Before he does anything, he prays a lot. And what does he pray? He prays, he prays a prayer that is powerful because he understands that prayer moves the hand of God. Prayer paves the way. Prayer is what brings a breakthrough. He understands what John Bunyan understood, and it's this. You can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you've prayed. Prayer needs to be the first thing. He says, pray often, for prayer is a shield to the soul, a sacrifice to God, and a scourge to Satan. I like that word, scourge. I don't use it often, but I want to start bringing it into my prayer life. Devil, I scourge you in Jesus' name. I'm bringing a scourge today to the darkness because I'm going to pray. James 5 says this, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. When we see the brokenness in our world, what do we do? We should pray. Can I get an amen? So how do we pray? What do we do? How many of you, like, you don't have to raise your hand, but you've gotten to a point where you go to pray and you're just kind of like, all right, I'm going to have a great prayer time. I'm going to do this. Like, they got me all fired up yesterday at church. Let's go. Get in there. All right. Good morning. You're like, I don't know what to do. What do you do? Nehemiah sneakily gives us a little, a little prayer pattern in chapter one. I want to break this down for you. It's, 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 a, it's a prayer pattern you can use. You can use every day. 
I've, I use this often. Sometimes when I'm like, ah, I'm kind of stuck, I'll just go to this. It's the acts prayer pattern. You can remember it like this. When you pray, God acts, A-C-T-S. And it's adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Now, here's what's cool. Like, I've prayed this prayer pattern a lot. I didn't even realize Nehemiah did the exact same thing in this chapter, but he does. And the first thing, the first part of the Acts prayer pattern is adoration. This is basically loving on God. This is basically saying, God, you are amazing. God, you're awesome. Look what Nehemiah says in verse five. Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God. Everybody say awesome. Awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Now, awesome isn't like California surfer dude, awesome. He's not saying that. He's like, God, you are awe-inspiring. You are amazing. You are big. You are bigger than anything I could ever face in this world. And when we start doing that, we, we do what the psalmist says. We magnify the Lord. When you magnify the Lord, what you are doing is like you're raising a magnifying glass up to God. He's like, well, does God need to be made bigger? No, we just need to see how big he really is. And as we start worshiping him, as we start praying and, and, and loving on him and praising him and lifting him up, saying, God, you are amazing. You've done all of these things. You created this. You created that. God, you, you are amazing. There is no one like you. You are the great and glorious king. There is no one like you, God. You start doing that. You start seeing God for how big he is. All of a sudden, your problems don't seem so big anymore. Right? So you, you start with adoration. Second thing, you start, with, then you move to confession. Nehemiah will then now confess his sin and, his, and he'll acknowledge his need for forgiveness. Look at this. Let your ear be attentive and your ears open to hear the prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly towards you. We've not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. He's saying, God, I've got some fault here in this. He's owning it. Let me just say this. Apologizing is the quickest way to make traction in any relationship. I've just tried to train my brain. As soon as my wife says, I just really am feeling, I'm sorry. I just tell myself right there, I'm sorry. True story. It works. And I am. I know I'm sorry. Before you even tell me, I'm sorry. This is what he's doing with God. And he's owning his part. He's saying, he's not getting defensive. He's not justifying it. He's saying, God, I, I have done this. You know what? I think it's fair to say that all of us have a pretty good list every day of things we could confess and repent of. So it's like it's a great thing to start your day saying, God, I worship you. You're amazing. You're awesome. God, while I'm praising you, let me just say, God, I, I'm not, I, there's some stuff I did yesterday. There's that. There was that. There was this. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have thought that. I shouldn't have acted that way. God, please forgive me. And you know what will happen in your life when you start praying those prayers? start confessing it, you'll start making traction on that. Part of the reason we don't ever grow is because we don't own our stuff. And we don't confess it and we don't apologize for it. So we just continue to make the same mistake over and over and over again. Jesus will do this as well in the Lord's Prayer, right? Forgive us as we have forgiven our debtors. So you start with adoration, you move to confession, then go to thanksgiving. Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah reminds himself of the goodness of God in verse 10. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. God, remember when you did this? Remember when you came through for me? Remember when you answered prayer? When you did what we didn't think you could do? God, I want to thank you for that. God, I want to worship you for that. God, I, wanna, I just want to take a few moments. Before I start bringing my needs to you, I just want to walk through a couple of things and just testify a little bit. Whenever I start getting like worked up and through this whole building process, there have been plenty of moments when we didn't know about the merger and if it was going to happen. There were times I just had to start recounting the blessing. God, you called us here. You called us here. Lord, thank you that you provided a community center. We had no place to meet. 
There was no place to meet. The schools were saying no. And another church planner said, hey, the community center is really, really a great place. You should check it out. We checked it out. It worked. We grew. We couldn't find a place. We found North Campus. Grew, couldn't find a place. Found South Campus. I'll just start going through just the many miracles. God, you did this. God, you did this. God, you did this. You should do that for your own life every day. God, remember when we, we couldn't make the house payment? You came through for us. God, remember when we were sick in the hospital? You came through for us. God, remember when we didn't think we were going to have a kid? We prayed, we prayed. God, you came through for us. You start going through, you start thanking God. And then after adoration, confession, thanksgiving, now S, supplication. This is making your request. It's bringing your need to God. And he says this, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. He's praying this right before he's going to go to the king. Right before he's going to go to the king. And ask a bold prayer. And ask a bold request. But before he asks a bold request, he's praying a bold prayer. I want to encourage you to pray bold, big, glorious prayers. That honor God. That honor God. Saying, God, we need you. God, this situation is big. It's dire. I can't do this on my own. I don't even want to try. So God, before I do anything, I'm coming to you with all of it. And I'm asking you to be involved. And I'm asking you to take my kids. I'm asking you to take my marriage. I'm asking you to take this work situation. It is such a mess. God, I can't do this. But you can do anything. Bring God to the broken places in your life. Let's bring God to the broken places in our world. Let's actually change something. Let's actually move this kingdom of God forward as he wants us to. And we're going to start by hurrying up to wait. And so what, that's what I want us to do. I want us, before we run out of here. I want us just to wait on God for a moment. So would you stand at both locations, online? Let's just stand. And just quickly, we're just going to run through this, but I'm, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to walk through every, each, each of these. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And we're just going to pray. We say, God, we worship you. We turn to you, and we thank you, and we bring our needs to you. So can we just take a moment? Can we just pray? You can lift your hands. You can just find a place, make a sanctuary right here, or whatever you want to do. But let's just take a moment and let's worship. Father in heaven, we, we adore you. God, we make you great in this place. God, your name is great and you are greatly to be praised. God, your greatness no one can fathom. There is no one like you. You are the great God. You are great and glorious. You reign above all things. God, you are God. You are the one who spoke the world into existence. God, you are our protector. You are our shield. You are our strong tower. God, you are amazing. God, you are awesome. And Lord, we love you and we praise you. We lift you up in our lives. And Lord, we come to you and we, we know there are things in our lives that that we have fallen short in. And Lord, right now we bring these things to you and we confess them and we say, Lord, we want to turn from ourselves and we want to turn to you. We want to turn from our wickedness. We want to turn to your righteousness. God, let your hand be upon us. Lord, renew us again. Sanctify us, Lord. Make us right and make us close. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you have provided for us again and again and again. You have been faithful. You have been good. You have been kind. And so, Lord, it's with that understanding that we bring our needs to you. We bring the brokenness in our world. We bring the brokenness in our marriages. We bring the brokenness in our families, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our community, in our city, in our state, in our world. God, we bring these things to you, and we say, God, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done, God. Let it happen. Let it start right here. Let it start in our hearts, Lord. Let it start in Summit Park. Let it start in Lee Summit. God, we pray that we would be the light of Christ. Provide for us. Strengthen us. Heal us. And God, we are just so faithful to follow you. 
In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just take a moment. Let's just worship. Would you lift your hands all across this place? Say, God, you are my everything. Come on, let's just take a moment. Let's worship him.